Good evening and welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines in the South. Bitter dispute, more misery for commuters on the way as Southern Rail admits it's cancelling almost 250 trains every day. And what goes up must come down to earth. How Sussex astronaut Major Tim Peake is preparing for the most dangerous part of his mission in space. And a royal relic. Could the tomb of a king be hidden under the ruins of an abbey? Good evening. It's a bitter rail dispute that's causing travel misery for thousands of the South's commuters. Services on southern trains have been disrupted for weeks due to an industrial dispute over the planned role of conductors. And tonight, Southern has revealed an average of almost 250 trains every day are being cancelled. Ahead of a third day of strike action next Tuesday, Union leaders today claim that Southern bosses are deliberately cancelling trains. But the company's chief executive tonight denied that, saying it will now impose the changes. Our transport correspondent Mike Pearce reports. Once again, services will be badly hit during next Tuesday's strike in the row over guards no longer closing train doors. Large parts of Sussex and areas of Kent, Surrey and Hampshire will have no trains at all or a limited service. Passengers are advised to check. So it's a similar service to what we've operated on other strike days. Uh, we've slightly extended run-in times on, on a couple of routes. Uh, we suggest customers check on the website. Meanwhile, the war of words goes on. The RMT union say Southern are deliberately cancelling trains to make it look like guards are taking unofficial action. The RMT say you are deliberately cancelling trains. They've even tonight put a photograph out saying there was a crew available for one train that didn't run. That simply isn't true. Every train we cancel, we face a stiff fine. Uh, sometimes trains are cancelled because a member of True isn't, isn't available for an inward working or indeed for a working later on in, in that train's journey or diagram. So there's a categorical denial it is not true? Absolutely not true. We would not cancel trains deliberately. Where then does the dispute go from here? We will be moving ahead and imposing our proposals. Uh, that's reluctantly. We have spent six months trying to engage with the RMT and reach a collective agreement. Uh, the RMT have drawn a line in the sand on this. The RMT is considering more strikes in the coming weeks. Mike Pierce, ITV News, Victoria. A motorcyclist who led police on a three-hour chase across two counties at speeds of 100 miles an hour has been jailed at Lewis Crown Court. Gavin Collett evaded police helicopters and several police cars while jumping red traffic lights without even wearing a helmet. The pursuit only ended when Gavin from Broadwater in Sussex crashed. He fled the scene of the accident. Two men have been arrested after a double stabbing in Basingstoke. It happened during a fight in an underpass close to the town's leisure centre in Southampton last night. Both men in their 30s are being treated at Southampton General Hospital. One of them is described as being in a serious condition. A woman has appeared in court charged with murdering a man at a flat in Ryde on the Isle of Wight. 46-year-old Jolion Ray was found dead at the property on East Hill Road on Monday. Deborah Napier, who's 53 and from Basingstoke, was remanded in custody at Winchester Crown Court until September. The death of Labour MP Joe Cox has left the country in shock. And today, MPs from the South have been among politicians from around the world paying tribute to her. The 41-year-old mother of two was shot and stabbed shortly after a surgery in her West Yorkshire constituency. Today, flags flew at half-mast over Westminster. From there, our political correspondent Phil Hornby sent this. The House of Commons will meet for a special session on Monday so MPs can pay their tributes. And today MPs from our region have been speaking about their friend, starting with Alan Mack, the MP for Haven, Yorkshire-born, who became an MP on the same day as Joe Cox. We knew each other before we came into the House of Commons, so we did get on well. Uh, we'd worked together on a few issues in Parliament as well, um, particularly to do with the Middle East. Uh, she was a wonderful, fantastic campaigning MP and I think the attack on Joe was an attack on all our democratic values and the best thing we can do is carry on with the great work that she will have held dear. I had the utmost respect for her because she really did command a lot of confidence 
Uh, she, her, from her interventions in Parliament, she made really intelligent observations. So she's a real inspiration for everybody, myself included. She was someone who is emotionally very open, she was very friendly, she had huge warmth and was incredibly maternal. She kind of mothered me even though I'm older than her. I know that everyone that came into contact with her, you know, most notably the people she represented, are going to miss her um, you know, in, in a very, very real way because she was a remarkable, remarkable person. The referendum battle, so angry and so frenzied on both sides, has absolutely ground to a halt. But campaigning will resume, it'll have to. We're only days away from an absolutely momentous decision, although none of the politicians I've spoken to today have much appetite for it. We'll know the result of the referendum a week tonight. Phil Hornby reporting there. Now, nearly a million pounds is to be spent on a new flood defence wall in Winchester. The barrier will be built to protect the St Bede's and River Park areas, which were last flooded two years ago. Work's due to begin later in the summer and be ready by the end of the year. For the second year in a row, Hove has been named as the most desirable place for young professionals to buy a home. The BN3 postcode, which has an average house price of £387,000, has topped the list by Lloyds Bank. Brighton is the seventh most popular place for aspiring 25 to 44-year-olds. Scores of charities have lost money after the collapse of a firm in Sussex which processed donations for them. CCI, based in Burgess Hill, exchanged foreign currency for a commission. But the firm went into administration in 2014, owing millions. Now creditors have been told it's unlikely they'll get all their money back. Here's Malcolm Shaw. <laughs> Every year, St Catherine's Hospice in Crawley needs to raise £6 million to fund its work, providing end-of-life care. One source of income has been donations of foreign currency from local firms and people returning from holidays. The hospice employed a company called Coinco International to exchange the currency in return for a fee, but the firm collapsed, owing the hospice almost £8,000. Well, it's hugely disappointing, isn't it? Because as a, as, as a charity, you want to do the best for the people that deserve your services. We're caring for people at the end of their life and their families. We want to make sure we have the very best facilities and, 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 and staffing to be able to make the end of their life uh, as, as good as it can possibly be. We'd like to reassure anyone that donates to St Catherine's Hospice that, your, that their money is being used in the best possible way. It's now emerged that this hospice is just one of more than 170 charities owed around three quarters of a million pounds in total. Coinco International used to be based here in Burgess Hill. The former boss, John Baker, told us the company had £900,000 worth of foreign coins when it collapsed, more than enough to pay back the charities, something he claims the administrators failed to do. The administrators, RSM, deny this, saying all coin assets of the company were either banked in their local jurisdiction or disposed by specialist agents and dealt with in accordance with the joint administrators' legal advice. The administrators have also warned creditors there's little chance they'll get all their money back. We will work as hard as we can to get uh, money back, but we've been informed that the chances of getting anything near uh, the full amounts that we are owed to be very unlikely indeed. It's not just charities who've been left out of pocket. Coinco International also had a contract to collect money from parking metres in Brighton and Hove. The city council is owed more than £3 million. The collapse of CCI has come at a very high price. Malcolm Shaw, ITV News. Despite there being no campaigning today on the referendum as a mark of respect after the death of MP Joe Cox, this time next week, we will know whether we are in or out. But how will the result affect where we live? Well, today we speak to people in Southampton to find out their views. Poland joined the European Union in 2004, and right now around 25,000 Polish people are living in Southampton. So what impact has that had? Andrew has been to find out. If they come to Southampton, Mr Deputy Speaker, they will be struck by the commitment, the vision, the participation and the strong partnerships for success in Europe which exist in that city. 
It was in his maiden speech nearly a quarter of a century ago when former Southampton MP John Denham talked about the city's relationship with Europe. Fast forward to today and Southampton is home to 25,000 Polish people. Status ludzi, którzy tak naprawdę są tutaj długo, tak jak ten na przykład Andrzej. Many come to SOS Polonia for advice. Young Igor arrived in the city eight months ago. He says Southampton, without the Poles, would be a poorer place. Polish people are working for the companies and companies are not going to have like workers. They are paying taxes and everything. Most of Polish people are not coming here for benefits and stuff. Because Polish people are buying a lot of things from English companies. With the economy and immigration such hot topics in the EU debate, Southampton is an interesting place to look at. It used to be called the gateway to the world. And right now, one in 10 people living in Southampton have come from Poland. So what impact are they having on the city? This recruitment agency is next to a number of Polish shops in Shirley in Southampton. 75 to 80 percent of our workforce is Eastern European. Um, they're very good people. Um, they, all they've come into this country to do is obviously better themselves. Um, a lot of people don't like it, but uh, to be fair, if they weren't here, the jobs wouldn't get done as far as we're concerned. Andre Fresh came from Poland 14 years ago. He owns shops in Southampton, Eastleigh and Bournemouth. He worries a vote to leave could increase import taxes, but also feels leaving may boost businesses here. I believe that it will be better for economy because um, if Great Britain will leave the uh, European Union, it will be more competitions, competition between countries and companies we have to compete uh, more on the free market. The Polish people won't get to vote as you have to be a British, Irish or Commonwealth citizen. And if you're still undecided, Southampton Solent University is playing its part. This event at the city's art gallery heard from both sides, with the local economy one of the main talking points. The Institute for Mechanical Engineers claims we're going to need 182,000 extra skilled workers every year for the next 10 years. So we're not going to get those if we don't have the brightest and the best of those students coming in from the EU. And a, a, a loss of that would have a real impact on all of the businesses in this area. We have some very significant shortages of skills in the Solent area and it would give businesses the opportunity to fish in a much larger pond than just the European Union. It would be worldwide, people will be able to bring in the people with the skills we want rather than simply having to take everybody possible from the European Union that wants to come to this country for whatever reason. The debate here rages on. Andrew Pate, ITV News, Southampton. And you are watching ITV News here in the Meridian region coming up. We catch up with the proud parents of Sussex astronaut Tim Peake as they anxiously await his return to Earth from the International Space Station. And for more on all of our stories, you can head to our website itv.com forward slash Meridian. You can give us a call or why not get in touch via Facebook or Twitter. More of the day's news now, and it's been 40 years since commercial ferry operations began in Portsmouth. It's generated more than £70 million since it opened, with 19 million passengers and nearly 26 million vehicles travelling via the Hampshire city to Europe. Reading diver Chris Mears has been selected to represent Team GB at Rio. It's the 23-year-old's second Olympic Games. He'll be competing in the synchro diving event alongside his best friend, Jack, Jack Laffer. I think that the Rio Games are just going to be fantastic. I think uh, I've got a lot of experience to draw from, from World Series and obviously uh, competing uh, the London Olympic Games. Um, I'm much more mature than I was in London, so I'm excited to kind of use the knowledge and stuff that I've, I've learnt uh, from that experience and use that to my advantage in Rio. Now, after six months in space, Major Tim Peake will come back down to Earth tomorrow and quite possibly with a bit of a bump.
The astronaut from West Sussex will eject from the International Space Station in the Russian-built capsule for the most dangerous part of the mission. Yes, the capsule will reach a speed of 17,000 miles per hour, with the outer wall heating up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. When it finally lands, it's likely to hit the ground like a ton of bricks. So how has he been preparing for the final stages of his once-in-a-lifetime experience? Dan Rivers sends this mission from Mission Control in Kazakhstan. Well, Tim Peake will be back down to Earth uh, tomorrow morning at British time. Uh, he will have to cope suddenly with the debilitating effects of the Earth's gravity as he's pulled out of the uh, Soyuz capsule in the vast expanse of the uh, Kazakh steppe, an area which is chosen for landing because there are uh, are so few mountains, large flat areas for all the different scenarios that may unfold. If things go as planned, he'll probably experience about four times the Earth's gravity as he comes back to Earth. If things go wrong and they go for what's called a ballistic landing, uh, then he may pull something like 12G as he comes back in. He'll be checked as he's taken out of the Soyuz capsule immediately, then taken by helicopter uh, to Karaganda uh, Military Air Base, a further uh, check up there, perhaps a chance for his first shower in six months, and then straight on a plane uh, back to Europe to be reunited with his wife and two kids just in time for Father's Day. Well, it'll be a tense time for Tim Peake's parents, Nigel and Angela, who followed every hour of his mission from their home near Portsmouth. But they're happy their son is in safe hands and that they'll be well briefed about every aspect of the landing. Fred went to talk to them about this extraordinary episode in their lives. <laughs> We used to be people in our own right, now we are Tim Peake's parents. And we don't mind that at all, I mean, it's all about him. I think the upside of it is that the response from people has been so heartwarming and so um, enthusiastic, especially the young children who've taken this mission really as their own and they've really got behind it, which is what Tim wanted to um, achieve. Angela, as a mum, you were there at the launch in Kazakhstan. I mean, it's dangerous. What were your feelings? We were kept very busy, so I don't really think I had time to think about it until the moment the rocket took off, and then I found that very emotional. I was just so thrilled for Tim, to be honest. He worked so hard um, for his mission. Nigel, he is an extraordinary young man, and yet I think you've said to me before, at school he wasn't a particularly high achiever, was he? No, he, he persevered the whole time. So. By his own admission, um, he got what he calls modest A-level results, but he just set his heart on something and said, I will do that. And, and a word that's cropped up in his reports at primary school and secondary school was perseverance. If he wanted to go down a certain road, that would be it. We're so close now to the landing. Angela, what are your feelings about that? I know it's a dangerous part of the mission, just like other things are but um, I know we'll be well looked after and um, everyone talks us through it. So I think when we understand what's happening, it makes an awful lot of difference. We know that it's not a particularly pleasant experience. I mean, it has been described even a good landing is something like a fairly bad car crash, but it's a well-proven method of re-entry. So uh, you just think, there we go, let's watch it. And when he comes home, what's gonna happen, do you suppose? Will there be a party? Will there be a big family gathering? Um, to be honest, I don't know when he will get back to Westbourne. Um, <laughs> I think we'll try and take a uh, curry and um, I've made some mince pies and brandy butter. Looking forward to seeing your son again? Very much so, yes. I mean, he's obviously going to be fairly tired when he first gets back and he's going to have to reacclimatize to being in a gravity environment. But yes, it'll be great to see him face to face and hear all his adventures. He's really enjoyed it, hasn't he? He's loved it, yeah, and he's been doing so many experiments and he's thoroughly enjoyed those. This is your son, Angela. You must be very proud. Yes, I am. He had a name in mind and I think he, he made it. On a safe journey home, Tim Peake's mum and dad talking to our Fred there. Now, surveyors have begun excavating land around the ruins of Reading Abbey in search of the missing remains of King Henry I. Archaeologists believe the royal who died in 1135 could be one of several kings to be found in recent years. Just two years ago, the pelvic bone believed to be that of King Alfred the Great was found in Winchester. And in 2012, the bones of Richard III were found under a car park in Leicester, of course. Luke Hanrahan has more. 
The tomb of a king could lie beneath these 900-year-old ruins. Reading Abbey, the most likely site of the royal remains of King Henry I, the son of William the Conqueror. He died in Rouen in northern France and was brought over to Reading to be buried here. His body arrived at the waterfront in, in Reading on the 5th of January 1136 and he was buried in front of the high altar the day afterwards, the 6th of January 1136. A king who wanted to be buried in the abbey he founded. Uh, this is the house that I live in. Father and, uh, John O'Shea's back garden, a stone's really throw really from where it's yeah. thought Henry yeah. ended up. And this is the ruin of the north transept. I live here and <laughs> close to me is, is this great uh, king. Henry is buried immediately behind this ruin. Uh, which would be the sanctuary area of the church, would be where the high altar uh, was positioned. Which is now the site of a nursery, a building constructed from the remains of the abbey. The historical evidence shows that Henry I is probably buried beneath this playground. Archaeologists are now trying to establish whether or not that is true. This whole area scanned using ground-penetrating radar geophysics which will help determine the exact location on the abbey grounds of Henry's tomb, which it's thought is made of silver. It isn't just a local or even national significance, this is of European history. So finding another grave of a Norman King of England, the last Norman King of England, would be historically very important. Once the data has been analysed, a dig could begin to uncover another of England's lost kings. Luke Hanrahan, ITV News. Well, from Reading Abbey to Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire now, where one of the country's best-loved actors has opened the annual Flower Festival. Yes, Sir Ian McKellen braved the mud in his pristine white suit to hand out prizes to the best in bloom. He told us he's a huge flower fan. I think one of my earliest hobbies was arranging flowers, actually, to my mother's surprise. But uh, we had a lot of, we had a big garden and a lot of cut flowers. But now I live in the middle of London. I've only got a, a, a terrace. There are flowers on it, and actually the agapanthus are just coming up my terrace. And uh, I'll be running back to see if they're uh, in blossom yet. But um, no, I, I just love flowers. I always, I always have a lot of cut flowers in the house. It, it just, it just makes the house feel more special, doesn't it? does indeed and the flower festival is on all weekend but will we get the perfect weather i don't know simon will tell us well you've got to love flower anyway haven't you self-raising my favorite oh, but yeah. um, we we've certainly had very good weather for flowers growing weather because we've had a bit of sunshine then a bit of rain which is perfect have a look at some of the pictures of what's been blooming cameron boss gorgeous look at those poppies Lovely. in fording bridge and greg parker is delighted that the one in his garden in Brockenhurst finally opened this week too. And have you ever seen blue poppies? No. Uh, from Rita Edgecock. Uh, thrilled she's managed to grow Himalayan poppies for the very first time. Impressive. Uh, there are also some splendid looking, take a deep breath, Lamp Rock Apnos Spectabilis, or Bleeding Hearts to you <laughs> and me. What? I didn't get that. From, uh, yeah, Bleeding Hearts, <laughs> leave it there. From Andrew <laughs> Cook in Wars Ash. And it's not all good news though, because this dandelion clock that Nick Lucas photographed in Ashley Heath Definitely on borrowed time. Gorgeous picture, though. But uh, Mick Bannister in Sussex has got this strange thing growing. That was it three weeks ago. That's it a fortnight ago. And this is it now. Massive, isn't it? Weird. Still no idea what it is. If you can tell us, Rudy and Weather at ITV. It's locked out upside down yucca. Thanks, Alan Titchmarsh. <laughs> <laughs> right, what's going on this weekend then? Let's find out from our Simon. From blizzards to pool, driving through Europe, Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Well, the good news is you don't have to worry too much about taking an umbrella with you everywhere this weekend because it is going to be a mostly dry story and with a bit of fine weather into the bargain. Basically, we've got a ridge of high pressure developing. Uh, that means the fronts will stay away well until Sunday when we get an increase of cloud through the day and then we'll see some rain arriving to take us overnight into Monday. Next week looking a bit unsettled, but between now and then, as I say, nothing too tricky to worry about. Although we still have that Met Office weather warning in place until 10 o'clock tonight. Still some 
quite hefty showers quite likely over the next couple of hours. Risk of some localised flooding too, but by around 10, 11 o'clock, it's a largely dry story for the rest of the night. Some clear spells, temperatures staying up into double figures. And tomorrow morning should get away with a dry start. There'll be some bits of brightness around as well. The cloud will thicken through the day and there is a chance of catching an odd shower. Best of any brightness down towards the south coast. Not quite as mild as it's been, but still with temperatures up to around 17, 18 degrees. As for your high tide times, you can see in Portsmouth, 22, 11 in the morning, just before 11 in the evening. Then Sunday, another mostly dry day, but cloud will increase and there'll be some rain arriving by the night time. Euro Tunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Keeping a close eye on summer. The Pollen Count, sponsored by Eilergy Eye Drops. Well, it's grass pollen that's the biggest cause of hay fever and through tomorrow, a relatively decent day levels will be high. They'll be even higher on Sunday, but they will drop on Monday when things are damper again. And in just a moment, we've got the ITV Evening News tonight with Alistair Stewart and Ran Veer Singh. For now, though, from the team here at ITV Meridian, thanks so much for watching. Have a great weekend. Have a very happy weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. No,